Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates. Okay, what I want to do, take about three minutes to go over the history as to how I morphed from an RF designer dealing in megahertz and gigahertz to the low frequencies involved in loudspeakers. And that happened after I left Macintosh and I teamed up with another fellow who also lost his job at Macintosh. Macintosh had a retrenchment in 1974, uh, financial problems, and they dumped about half their engineering staff. So a bunch of us were, were gone. So I teamed up with this other fellow and we formed a, uh, a little loudspeaker company in 1975. Uh, the, the, fellow, the other fellow is Milu Nestorovic. He's Yugoslavian and has a doctorate from the University of Belgrade in audio and, audio and acoustics. So he taught me all he knew about speakers. And so the two of us formed a, a small corporation to manufacture loudspeakers. And I was the designer of the filter circuits used in the crossovers, and I couldn't make anything work. They sounded awful. I would, we had advanced test equipment, we have FFT analyzers and all the, all the acoustic equipment needed to measure speakers. And it turns out that the ordinary crossovers that people use don't work. When you design, you using the conventional constant K M drive type of fillers that you learned in sophomore year, college and circuit, you know, and circuit design, uh, these filters uh, have slow slope on e either side of the pass band. So when you have a bunch of loudspeakers in a, in a box at different frequency ranges, and they, they're connected to these kind of a filter, uh, the pass bands overlap each other, causing acoustic wave interference. And there's just no way that speaker is going to work. Be because in the three-dimensional acoustic space, the sound is scrambled. And this is even true today in many loudspeakers that use conventional slow slope filters. So I had the bright idea of using my technology from radio design of using a brick wall amplitude response. Those of you who know filter theory means that if you have a brick wall response, you have a pass band from the lowest frequency to the highest frequency, F1 to F2. And then outside that, there's nothing. It drops right off. So I whipped up a crossover using these kind of filters. And that eliminated the wave interference. And it was a vast improvement in sound. And those filters still being used today by Joseph Audio. Now, the the frequency response is fine. It's flat. You go all over the room, no matter where you put the microphone, it's flat. But there's another problem, which I didn't think really existed, but people were telling me, you've got to fix it. And that is time alignment, making all the sound come out of the box at the same time. And if you fire up your FMT analyzer, you'll notice there will be group delay error. You'll be group delay error at the crossovers. Oh, and I said, it, it's small, it, it's, it's milliseconds. And I said, you can't hear that. And uh, John Miller here, who we're in his house and he owns a pair of my $31,000 Joseph Curls. So I had an idea, let me see if I can fix time alignment. And I had an idea. Let's scrap everything I know about crossovers and I'm gonna design a crossover as if it were a constant impedance electrical network which is a generalized theory of uh, network theory that when you look at the input terminals of that network, it is a resistor. There's no frequency dependence whatsoever. So I, let me model that technology into a loudspeaker crossover, and I have advanced software to do that. And I did a model of a two-way crossover with a crossover frequency of two kilohertz. And when I finished the model and then made measurements on the model, I had a flat frequency response. And I said, oh Lord, it's time aligned. Wow. 
completely linear phase. So let's build it. So I ordered all the parts to build a crossover. And Parts Express, an outfit in Ohio, makes speaker kits. And I ordered the Parts Express Solstice kit, which is a two-way loudspeaker. And it comes in a knocked down cabinet that you glue together and has all, and has a crossover with it and the drivers. Well, I built that cabinet and put my crossover in it. And it was shocking. For $1,300 worth of parts, I had a loudspeaker system that I would take it to dealerships, including Audio Classics here in Vessel, comparing it to 40 and 50 and $60,000 loudspeaker system. And it just blows them away. Now, John Miller here, I, I talked him into buying a pair of my $31,000 Joseph Curls. I bring the, uh, the, the $1,300 kit to his house and, he, and we listen. And John practically chopped my head off. You jerk. That kit blows away my pearls. What am I going to do with them? And I said, John, calm down. My pearls are no good either. Now, the pearl is a three way crossover. I had not figured out how to do the constant impedance network topology for a three way because it is intrinsically impossible. I said, oh, no, it's impossible. Well, there is a solution. I'm not going to go into the solution yet. It was stupidly simple. Uh, you basically take two two-way crossovers and you put them in series. And the one in the middle, what happened after I got this invention patented, people were finding out about me. They were emailing me and blah, blah, blah. There's an outfit called the Connecticut Audio Society, uh, obviously in Connecticut, and there are three audiophiles up there. They decided to build my crossover and and my and uh, and my and my solstice kits. They had an expert woodworker there, and you see a, a photo here. Of, they copied the Parts Express cabinet themselves, so they made their own cabinets. But then they uh, stuffed them with, and I, I built them the crossovers, and they. I made a little bit of money. I charged them six hundred dollars for six sets of crossovers, which may be a teeny bit of money, and uh, his. And a slide showing two two of their finished loudspeakers. So they were three audiophiles that built loudspeakers with my new invention te technology and it had that dynamite sound. And they're extremely pleased. And it began to spread over the internet. Uh, two fellows in uh, New York City, one came to my house and they built the speakers there. A fellow in Wisconsin calls me up. Hey, can I come to your house and build a solstice kit? <laughs> you walk all the way to my house and we build a set of speakers. That's me in the Yannick chamber with the very first try at my crossover. And that's when I determined that, wow, it works. Uh, my wife is a retired professor from Binghamton University, so I have an in to get into the Binghamton University Yannick chamber. So. I spent hours and days in there. And this is the first solstice kit. And that also worked. And then now here we have the frequency response of the solstice kit measured at three different microphone positions. Now with ordinary speakers, if you move that mic, that response curve is gonna change. But if you notice here, they're identical with very, very small error between the curves. Now here's the time, here's time alignment. The top graph with, with, with the bump in the middle there, I'm looking, at, this is an FFT analyzer of group delay. And I, I went from DC to four kilohertz. So the, in the middle is two kilohertz is where the crossover is. So the early Joseph Audio speaker, the Joseph Audio model, our RM20, had that group delay error. The new topology, based upon the constant impedance network, is the group delay is absolutely flat. And then we go to the impulse response. Uh, the early technology is the top graph. And that, that impulse is scrambled. You don't, you don't see a uniform decay, where in the bottom graph, the decay is up, down, up, down, up, down, and then it dies to a silence. And you can listen to the impulse. The one on the top sounds like a plop, 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 plop. 
or the one on the bottom goes chick, 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 chick. So it's very clean. And uh, this is this fellow sitting on my right. This is his house. The, the very angry John Miller says, you jerk, <laughs> my pearls are useless. So we spent a whole day uh, redoing his uh, pearls. And of course it was glorious sound. And John will tell you that he did us out of this world. Uh, I got the idea to try it in a clip form. This was a set of derelict clip forms in audio classics uh, that were in their junk room. And I said, let me uh, wire up a three-way crossover in the clip form. And we did some listening to that in audio classics. And those clip shorts sang with the voices of angels. It was a beautiful sounding speaker. And uh, turned out a fellow, an audiophile that I know down in Maryland, heard about the, the clip shorts at audio classics. He has a pair of clip shorts. So I said, you got to build me a crossover, he said. So I did. And sight unseen, I built the crossovers, mailed them to him. He installed them, and he says, it's dynamite. And uh, I haven't gone down there to listen to them at his house yet. We're planning a trip either late this month or in sometime in May to go down there and do a listen. And this, this is the measurement on the clip form. And as you can see, the amplitude response is, is quite flat. It's within, you know, it's not perfect. It's within about 4 dB across the whole, pa the whole pass band there and some wiggles in it. And you notice the delay. If you have a constant slope against a log frequency scale, that's constant delay all through the mid range. Now it's a little bit slow in the, in the base frequencies and it goes off at the very high frequencies, but you don't care. You want to get the mid range right. And that mid range is very nearly a straight line. And uh, that, that, that's the clip one. It's sound, it's, it's sound with the voice of the angels, a beautiful sound. Um, I, I used to uh, sell Hewlett Packard test equipment to Bell Laboratories up in uh, North Andover, Massachusetts. and. They had some pretty sharp fellows there who did some brick wall filters amplitude wise, but you know the the sharper and the closer to an approximation of a brick wall in amplitude, uh, the closer they got to that, uh, the the phase was just a total mess. So I'm trying to figure out you know if the if the phase gets all wonky when you're going up to these higher and higher order filters to do the brick wall in amplitude. Um, I don't see how time alignment of, of voice coils or speakers is going to be able to take care of the horrendous phase response you get when you're using a brick wall filter in amplitude. Can you yeah. enlighten me yeah, on that yeah. a bit? Uh, there are multiple ways of obtaining a brick wall amplitude response. Uh, when I designed the IF filters in the Macintosh MR78 tuner, I did that in the computer. And the usual way they, they do brick wall filters uh, is a brute force method where you cascade many, many stages of uh, M derived type filters. And that's going to have a terrible phase response. Right. But at the center, if you, do that, if you make a cascade of mutually coupled coils, this is a transformer now. You're not using, uh, you know, lattice networks. You're using transformers. Okay. Uh, and I, I wrote a computer program that would do a brick wall filter and adjust the coupling on all the transformers, such as to maximize the flatness of the group delay over as much of the pass band as possible. And you can get it very close. So that made a very low distortion, high selectivity FM tuner I, I, IF filter that did not have delay errors that would ruin the, uh, the, the, the demodulated signal as it went through the uh, the, the IF filter and then into the discriminator for detection. So the MR78 had a very low distortion, super high selectivity, and, and again, a computer design filter using mutually coupled coils cascaded in series. And I don't think the, 
the other fellows did that. Uh, and those of you who are radio hands, a lot of your communications receivers use a uh, brick wall filter uh, approximations uh, uh, using 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 virtually a couple transformers. And the phase linearity of those IFs would be pretty good. But uh, none of these audio guys know about <laughs> using radio theory to develop, to do crossovers. I'm the only one. Yeah, so my question is, you know, if you if you look at um, a typical dynamic driver, as you approach the resonance of the driver, the impedance, uh, the electrical impedance goes way up. And and then otherwise, when you when you go away uh, from that resonance, the impedance is you know approximately the nominal impedance of the driver, like eight ohms. And, and it's and it's electrically you know it's smooth electrically, but the the sound pressure response uh, does not have that uh, does not have an anomaly in the same place. It often has uh, uh, ripples uh, far away from where the uh, the resonance, uh, mechanical resonance of the um, driver is. And I don't, it's, it's not intuitive to me that you could achieve a constant impedance network that would also be constant sound pressure. And unless I'm missing something, that's what I, uh, I was wondering. Okay, you know, it is true that in the speakers that I designed, the impedance is generally uh, from about 150 to 200 hertz, right on up to 20 kilohertz. It's almost nearly perfectly flat at eight ohms. But when you get down into the base region, now you have a, a very different situation. You have uh, the, the low frequency drivers, the woofers are in a box. And this box may have base reflex loading or it may have uh, closed box loading or any other kind of a loading. This gives a very complex impedance curve. And uh, there is no way to compensate it. Uh, and it doesn't cause any problems. Uh, if it's designed properly and you're feeding uh, the loudspeaker system with an amplifier with any kind of a decent damping factor, then everything works. The huge variations in impedance cause no problems. Uh, but those huge variations in impedance is the complex interaction you have between the physical characteristics of the air inside the box and the, the mechanical resonance of the drivers themselves. And there's all kinds of uh, computer programs that uh, allow you to match a driver to a box of a given size and you can optimize it for maximum uh, base pass band and so forth. So, so, so again, all of the low frequency ranges, that, that varies, variation impedance is no problem. Uh, you're driving it usually with an amplifier with a very high damping factor where the internal impedance of the amplifier is a fraction of an ohm. And that controls the frequency response of the uh, loudspeakers in the box. Does that make sense? I hope I made the sense there. Yeah, more or less. I I just say sometimes there are a lot of um, features in the sound pressure of a uh, of a particular driver that need compensation, and I, I guess are you doing that with your so you uh, if you well, what you do is this you you look at an individual driver or say in the two way system that, I, that in the solstice kit the. The six and a half inch driver there is of extremely uh, high high technical level of expertise in, in driver design. Is it? It's a six and a half inch driver with a three inch voice coil, huge voice coil, and that driver will go up to about two kilohertz nearly perfectly. Now, as you as as the driver gets near the higher frequencies, the it no longer, the cone no, no longer moves in and out as a piston. It, it starts to go, uh, it, it will break up into different sections of the cone vibrating in different directions. 
And that's where they, that's where a driver will fall apart. And that, that six and a half inch driver that, that's used in the Solstice kit is very good up to two kilohertz, but then it very rapidly falls apart above that. And that's where you need an infinite slope crossover to cut that thing off fast. So uh, in my demo at the AWA with the three-way speakers, uh, it had a crossover of 200 hertz between the bass and the mid-range, and uh, two kilohertz from the mid-range out to the tweeter. So Joseph Pearl has a, uh, uh, it's in two sections. There's a bass cabinet, and then a smaller cabinet on top that has the mid-range and tweeter on it. So in the demo that I did, the live demo at, at AWA, I uh, disconnected the small box on top so that only the woofer was sounding. I was playing a, a CD of uh, Diana Krall, a live concert, and she was singing. When I unhooked the top, she disappeared. All you heard was boom, 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 and, and, and the bass. The whole, the orchestra was gone because that was a 200 hertz crossover at, with, with infinite slope. Anything above 200, 200 hertz was gone. And it, it was quite an amazing demo to, to, to hear that happen. You, know, you can't do that with ordinary speakers. You unhook the, you'll still hear the, You'll still hear the mid range and tweeter, even if you un unhook that part of the crossover. Well, Conway says there must be a lot more than a crossover network. What about the speakers themselves? Will the good network make a poor speaker sound better? And part two is is your network all analog? Would a digital filter, if fast enough, do as well? Uh. <laughs> a good question, but you see, my, my crossover is nothing more than a passive network that's in the box. And so the input terminals of the box go through the crossover network and then it, it feeds the energy to the different drivers. It's, it's all analog, it's all passive circuitry. And uh, actually, rather simple. Uh, the two transformers one, two, three, four coils, one, two, three, four, five, six capacitors, and one, two, three, four, five resistors. That's the whole thing. It all fits on a couple of circuit boards. And, that, and that, that's in the three-way crossover. So they're really rather simple. In fact, most of my crossovers use fewer parts than the, the ordinary crossovers that, that other designers use, but some of them have a horrendous number of parts. Uh, I don't remember what it was. I looked at, at the Clipshorn crossover at Audio Classics, and it's on a great big circuit board, and it had about 50% more components on it than my crossover had. My mind was actually simpler. Second part of the question is digital. Yeah. Oh, digital. No, I, that, that's outside my uh, field of expertise. Is I'm a child of the 1940s. I still live, still live in the past. It's back, my whole audio circuit, my whole audio system is vacuum tubes. Even the MR78 tuner I designed for Macintosh's Solisate tuner, I built myself a tube MR78. I just, I, I just had to have one. Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates.